Okay, this is my screencast for um, the uh, chapter six, I believe. This is the temperature and entropy chapter in the um, uh, for our class here today. So let's scroll down here. This is again the um, the to get to this, you click on today, this week in the calendar. So what I'll cover is uh, the definition of temperature. Um, twice apparently, the consistency with the old definition, the financial anal analogy, the Boltzmann factor, and some simple applications. So um, scrolling down here a little bit, um, start with the definition of temperature. Um, we have this notion that um, the total entropy of a system is just the sum of the various entropies. Uh, this came about because we did the natural log of the previous chapter. If you don't do the natural log and you're doing microstates, then you get a product but we're really going to make use of the fact that it's the sum here. So it's just the add up the entropy of one system and the entropy of the other system. Now the system comes to rest, it reaches some sort of equilibrium when um, when S is maximized. That's the whole point of the previous chapter here. So um, what happens is the system tries lots of combinations of uh, energy A and energy B to make that happen. Um, but of course uh, energy A and energy B are related um, they have to add up to some total, so you can't just arbitrarily change both of them. And um, this notion of maximizing something is really a calculus idea, right? We have to find the derivative and set it equal to zero. Okay. So now what? one of the big things that happens here, I say the big deal is next, um, is in the equation T61.B. Um, we say, okay, well the derivative has to be zero, but we know that the total entropy is just the sum of a couple of different entropies. And we're taking a derivative of that. We use the sum rule of derivatives. We say, oh, well, we take the derivative of one, the derivative of the other. Looks like I forgot a couple of d's here. Um, well, it looks like I forgot d's all over the place. I apologize about that. But it's this next equal sign that actually is, I think, that author takes another couple of equations to get to it. It's the big deal here. We want to actually have a's with a's and b's with b's. Um, and again, there should be little d's here, right next to the u's. Um, but the notion that is if UA, let's say, goes up, then UB has to go down because the total energy can't change. And so whatever tiny little change you make to A, the opposite change has to happen to B. And that's why this plus sign becomes a minus sign. So that's the really big deal here. Uh, quickly, I wanted to uh, show you another example of, of one of the figures that, that's in the book here. So you, once you go to this website, you can also play with this. I draw. There's three different curves drawn here. Uh, let's see, the red curve is um, the system with five molecules in it, okay? And so as you give more and more energy to it, um, the entropy goes down. Does that make sense? Let's see, I would have expected the entropy to go up as energy went up. Um, oh, I know, I see the problem now. Yep, it looks like the very first one is black. So this is the first one, the five units of energy. And as you give it more energy, its entropy goes up. This is a, um, the, the red one is has uh, three molecules. As you give it more energy, its entropy also goes up, but giving it more energy is moving right to left here. Well, let me be clear what I mean here. This axis is the energy given to the black system. If you give more energy to the black system, the red system has less, so its entropy goes down. Okay, then I just add them up, and you can see that this curve here has a maximum about right here. And so apparently that is going to be where the system will finally um, land. And so it turns out that sure enough, if you look carefully, the slope of this one is the same magnitude of the slope of that one, right where there's a peak. And that's what this equation up here is saying. The slopes are equal and opposite. This one is positive, this one is negative. So we get to uh, the big deal right here, T6.3, probably the biggest deal of the whole chapter. And what is it saying? That when a system reaches equilibrium, that that is a true statement. And here you see the A's are lined up and the B's are lined up. Okay, so what's the next section? That Well, still in the f this first section of the chapter, we have these two major things. We have that when um, two things are e in equilibrium, their temperatures are the same. We learned that way back in chapter one or something like that. And now we have um, that when two things are in equilibrium, that their the derivative of entropy with respect of energy is the same. Um, so um, we wonder if there might be some relationship between temperature and this weird derivative thing. And so of course I say that we make the leap that some, there is something related. 
Um, it would be great if we could just set them equal to each other. Wouldn't that be cool? Just set them equal to each other and you're all done. But the problem is when you put two things together, uh, heat flows from the hot temperature to the warm temperature. Sorry, <laughs> let me say that again. Heat flows from the hot temperature to the cold temperature. Um, but as far as these derivatives are concerned, heat flows from the um, low slope to the high slope. So um, unfortunately, just setting them equal doesn't do it. And the thing that seems to work best, we find, is this interesting um, inverse relationship, which I've written a couple of different ways. Now, your book introduces this partial derivative. All we're saying there is, hey, find out how entropy changes when you change the energy, but make sure you don't change anything else. Don't change the number of particles, don't change the volume, all kinds of things like that. And so the partial derivative is just a slick way of saying keep everybody else constant. So as far as consistency with the old definition here, um, 6.2, um, it's a very, all they're doing is they're comparing this with the Einstein solid work that was done before. It's a pretty nasty derivation, um, very carefully figuring out what happens as you make small changes to those um, factorial calculations. But the upshot, either way, you find that the energy of the entire system is the same. And so um, apparently with this definition of temperature, which is at the top of the screen here, um, is the same as the temperature idea we were using back in chapters 1, 2, and 3. Next comes this financial analogy. I don't know how you guys feel about it. Maybe we'll talk about it in the discussion board. Um, I've talked about it a little bit, this notion that if, you know, would Bill Gates bend over and pick up a, a $100 bill? Uh, the joke is that he wouldn't because he has so much money, why would he care? But the rest of us would happily pick it up and do something with it. And so the way I like to think about it is that when you're cold, um, if I give you just a little bit of energy, you're happy to do a whole bunch of stuff with that, okay? But if you're already hot, and I give you a little bit of energy, you sort of shrug it off. You don't do much with it. Um, so the book does energy and is money. I'm, I'm saying the same thing. Entropy is happiness. I'm actually saying entropy is stuff you can do. Um, and then the temperature is the generosity. Um, is this notion of you know how willing are you to give or receive? Hopefully we'll talk more about that in the discussion board. Okay, next the toughest section by far, this Boltzmann factor business. Uh, what's going on? So uh, one major take-home message, and it is that nature is lazy. Um, so what do I mean by that? So we always seem to find that everything seems to always go to its lowest energy state. We tell our students that hydrogen atoms like to go to their lowest energy state, and that that's where all the electrons are, and that if you add another electron to it, it has to, because of the Pauli exclusion principle, it's sort of forced to go to the next energy state. But if you reflect on how you study the hydrogen atom, all those energy states are they're all the same. In, the, in next semester, you know, there's no reason where, why electrons would choose one over the other. Well, here we learn why. It's this whole notion of a reservoir. So the four major things that happen, we ask questions about single molecules. We treat that single molecule as system A. We're always doing two systems, remember? We treat everything else as system B. We call that the reservoir. And it needs to be big. You'll see why in a second. And then you just do a whole bunch of probability calculations and use the definition of temperature. There's a couple of sneaky math tricks here. Um, first of all, if A loses a little bit of energy, the reservoir, of course, has to gain it. This is a system. Energy can't just be lost. Okay? That's one of the ma sneaky math tricks. Another sneaky math, tr math trick is that um, if the reservoir is big enough, maybe you give it a little bit of energy. Uh, its temperature is not going to change. Think about adding a, you know, pouring a hot cup of coffee in the ocean. The temperature of the ocean is not going to change, even though you've given it some energy. If that's true, you can monkey around with the definition of temperature and find that if you're looking for changes of entropy, it's going to be related to changes of energy. But of course, the energy change of the reservoir is absolutely related to the change of the molecule just doing single level changes, quantum level energy changes. You put all that together, and of course it's all harkens back to microstates and macrostates and all of that stuff, and you get this magic equation, T623. This is why nature is lazy. If you want to know the probability of being found in a particular energy, you calculate something about it, and of course you have to divide by everybody, okay, to figure out what the whole pie is if you're thinking about like a pie chart or something. We use it over and over and over again in the homework. So just one sort of fun example. Um, Imagine, you know, 
the chances of, of your son or daughter actually being awake and ready to go to school? Well, of course, uh, nature's lazy. Kids are lazy. They'd rather be in bed. Let's go ahead and assume that they need one breakfast's worth of energy to wake up and be out of bed. So let's assume there's two energy states for a kid, in bed or well-fed and out the door. And let's assume this happens randomly as opposed to you waking them up and feeding them. Um, so let's see here. Well, it's this very simple probability. The probability of being awake is e to the minus the energy of a breakfast, let's say 500 capital C calories, divided by Boltzmann's constant, uh, and of course divided by 273, which a cold Minnesota day. And then you divide by all the possible ways this kid can exist. Well, there's the way we just calculated, being awake. What about being asleep, in bed? Well, let's call that zero energies. If you go back up here, if you put a zero right there, a zero, you're going to get um, just the number one. So that's what I've done here, one. So I wonder what that's going to give us. Let's go to Google Calculator here. And so I've gone to Google Calculator, and you see what I typed in. Um, and it says that, well, uh, 500 capital C calories is 500 kilocalories. And I divide through by everything. And just that part, just what's going to go in the exponential, is a monstrous number, 10 to the 26. We're going to put a negative sign in front of that and exponentiate it. It's effectively 0. Okay. So if we go back, we find that the probability is 0 divided by 1 plus 0, which is 0, which is probably what you thought about your own kids.